third and last uh, breakout panel here in 204. Um, well, this topic is Cool Japan, Otaku, Fashion, and Art. And please allow me to introduce you the panelists. Uh, we have uh, Misha Jeanette, who's a fashion director, journalist, and blogger right here. We have Mr. Uh, Naomitsu Kodaka, who is co-founder and CFO of uh, Tokyo Otaku Mode. And we have Mr. Fumio Nanjo, director of the Mori Art Museum. And our moderator for this session is Mr. Takaki Umezawa, who's director of board and managing director Japan of AT Kearney. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, joining the session. Uh, this is uh, about uh, Cool Japan, and we have a very uh, diverse and distinguished um, panelists here, as you can see. Uh, one of the panelists uh, kindly violated the dress code, uh, which uh, actually I asked him to do so. <laughs> but that is um, fun. So uh, let me start from uh, giving you a very quick overview of uh, what uh, the government and um, team in the field uh, have been working on the Cool Japan. And then uh, hand over to the panelists uh, to discuss um, what uh, they've found uh, in their respective field. Uh, we started um, the so-called Cool Japan uh, project as uh, one of the government-sponsored projects uh, in 2010. And um, we set up a panel called a Cool Japan Advisory Council, which included Nanjo-san here, as well as myself. And uh, we discussed a lot of uh, things uh, to, to make uh, this phenomena into a sustaining one, a more powerful one, especially in overseas markets. And uh, as a result, um, a couple of people, including myself, uh, made a, a proposal to Mary about uh, setting up a government-sponsored fund. And that fund uh, will be launched in November this year. And, um, well, let's see. Um, the Cool Japan, um, as I said, um, was uh, initiated in 2010, but uh, luckily it was handed over to the current LDP uh, government. And now uh, it's becoming one of the pillars of uh, the so-called uh, third arrow. So as uh, Feldman san said this, this morning, basically we have to move every uh, parts of that 60% of the three 60% we have to move. And uh, it's gonna be one of them. Uh, the target is uh, quite aggressive. Uh, Meti says that uh, we like to generate additional revenues of uh, uh, 80 to $110 billion uh, by 2020. So uh, it is really not only about uh, promoting Japan overseas, but also about actually creating a new growth sector. And those sectors will include uh, fashion, cuisine, media content, art, and inbound tourism. So it is about many uh, creative industries um, we like to uh, really develop. The fund I described earlier, uh, is going to be launched in November. And uh, this is uh, uh, one key page um, we discussed um, between the, the committee members, including Nanjo-san. Uh, this is uh, what um, the fund uh, like to facilitate in key overseas markets, such as uh, uh, most likely Singapore, Hong Kong, Taipei, Jakarta, uh, or Bangkok. And uh, it's going to include uh, several facets of uh, business models, starting with uh, the street, uh, which means basically developing um, very sophisticated uh, cultural streets like the one you see in Urahara. So uh, you've been to Cat Street. Um, it's not replicating Cat Street, but uh, it is really about uh, developing streets with the local partners and local creative people uh, which uh, will symbolize um, the new way of uh, living life and a new way of uh, enjoying culture. And the second facet is uh, malls and food courts. That's where we do a lot of business, uh, including fashion malls and uh, food courts, which will have 
not only Japanese uh, restaurants, but also uh, the local cuisine to attract the local consumers on a daily basis. And lastly, uh, we're going to develop uh, e-commerce platforms, uh, which will um, help companies uh, market their products and services uh, in an efficient way. And the key part is that uh, we like to have an integrated ecosystem in respective uh, market, combining all these. And it needs to be supported by a media content uh, distribution. Uh, so, for example, uh, we're going to have a much more distribution about uh, Japanese animation uh, programs or Japanese uh, music videos, and uh, that will help um, develop uh, respective businesses uh, in, in that particular uh, market. And, and the fund, uh, which will have uh, initial capital from both uh, MOF as well as uh, private sector investors, uh, will be helping um, related companies uh, in, in those uh, projects. So that's what um, we like to, we like to initiate uh, starting uh, this November. So coming back to the panel, uh, I like uh, each one of the panelists to uh, introduce uh, themselves uh, and uh, describe what they have been doing uh, in respective field. Uh, Misha, can I start uh, from you, please? Yeah, you said something about a dress code, but in real fashion, there is no dress code. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I came to Japan in 2004. I was born in the US. Um, I'm not Japanese or Asian at all. Um, I was more attracted to the, actually the idea of living in Tokyo more than anything and studying fashion here because I thought I would be more inspired. Um, and I have been and I've stayed, uh, next year will be my 10th year. Um, and I came here to be a, a vi a create visions, my own visions, to be a stylist, a wardrobe stylist actually. And Bunka is a very uh, big school in Japan, it's where Yoji Yamamoto went and uh, many big designers graduated from there. So I feel very privileged to go. Um, in the end, I became a fashion journalist. Uh, there weren't very many people who had knowledge of the Japanese uh, industry, so upon graduation, I started as a columnist at the Japan Times newspaper, and I've been doing that um, ever since. Um, along with that, many other publications as a freelancer, such as um, CNN Travel, Kyoto News, uh, local magazines like Vogue um, and Numero. And um, what I do now, what I'm mostly known for now, actually, is my blog. Um, it's called Tokyo Fashion Diaries, and I started it right after the earthquake happened because as a freelance writer, I had all of these young designers at my fingertips, but the publications didn't really want them. It's kind of a waste of space. No one knows who they are. It's kind of weird. And uh, Japan was being kind of smacked around overseas, saying, oh, Japan is over. No one's going to shop anymore. Let's forget about Japan and look somewhere else. I'm thinking, wait a minute, you just don't know that there's cool stuff out there. So I started the blog, and um, a Japanese editor actually asked me if I would please write it in Japanese as well to educate the local people about what's around them that maybe they don't know about that me, um, as a professional, would, is finding cool out here in Japan. So I started the blog, and it's um, become, I've been very lucky, I've been able to travel the world thanks to it. And um, one thing that I do is I really, really pick up on young designers um, or even big designers, and what are they doing that's artistic? So it's not just that, oh, there's a new jacket by Mihara Yasuhiro. Why is it cool? Why is it artistic? Why is it unique in the world? And I say that to the people outside of Japan as well as inside of Japan, and I tend to kind of change my tone of voice depending on who I'm talking to, on who will find what parts interesting with what I'm talking about. And um, a couple of years ago, Carrie Pamu Pamu, the pop icon, broke out suddenly, really. I mean, she, did, she became an artist and immediately was just like a superstar. Because suddenly I started getting uh, requests from Japanese magazines on what I thought about kawaii. So what do you think about kawaii? What do you think? And I'm like, what is kawaii? Like, I know what kawaii is, but I'm not kawaii, you know? And so the, the, the meaning, the definition of kawaii, kind of changed at that point. So I kind of started to really relish in dressing up in kind of crazy Harajuku style. And um, that kind of became my signature. And so when I'd go to fashion, uh, fashion weeks and sit in the front rows, and it was always like the most 
crazily dressed one. And I still enjoy wearing Japanese brands overseas to fashion weeks and seeing what is popular and what's kind of people are like, oh, you know, and um, kind of seeing reactions and seeing like what what is the mood changing to? Is kawaii on the wayside? Is it still really popular? How do foreigners react to it outside of Japan? And um, I host a, an NHK TV show called Kawaii International. And I'm kind of the, the sensei, the teacher on the panel, just kind of talking about the trends and what it means and, and where it's going and, and things like that. So that's been really fun, and that's what I'm up to right now. But Misha, you don't mm -hmm. think that you being kawaii, mm -hmm. or you do? I d <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like Cool Japan. Can you call yourself cool and still be cool? Can I call oh, myself okay. kawaii and still be kawaii? <laughs> Uh, what is kawaii? I mean, that's actually something that we talk about a lot. A lot I mean, on the you're, show. The, you're the teacher of kawaii for the world, so you have to tell me. I, I like. I don't know. I got this at 109, which is a very like you know Shibuya style, actually. But everything's mixed up now. You can find kawaii in Shibuya. You can find kawaii in Akihabara. You can find kawaii everywhere. Like, what is kawaii? I think kawaii is just a uh, Japanese style of fashion. Yeah. Although, like, Comme des Garçons, like, very cerebral, avant-garde. I don't know if you call them kawaii, if they'd be offended or not. I think they would be offended. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but that's what we're trying to find out now. Like, what, what is Japanese fashion, you know? Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about it later. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Please. So, Nanjo-san, please. I'm now running a museum, Moriat Museum, but I had been a curator for contemporary art. So I made a, a lot of exhibitions. But when I did the big exhibition, sometimes I included many um, um, different factors other than contemporary art. Sometimes I included fashion. Um, sometimes fashion made by artists. Um, so it's like that. And then at the same time, when I do a big exhibition like a Biennale or Triennale in some city, uh, I had been always trying to expand the exhibition to the city. So many artworks are spread in the city and people uh, walk around in the city to look for art. We of course provide some maps and uh, plans uh, I mean, uh, for the exhibition. So now, uh, in Roppongi, we have an art night, Roppongi Art Night, which is only one night event, but uh, uh, we spread like 100 artworks in the city uh, between uh, Midtown, Roppongi Hills, and New National Art Center. So for this event, uh, we say, officially, we say 600,000 people come on one night. But actually, this is actually, I tell you, that this is a counting by three spot. <laughs> so, so maybe 200,000, OK? <laughs> Don't tell this to many people. <laughs> but th by this way, you know, we're trying to fuse contemporary art, other cultures, um, otaku culture even, and uh, the city, and the da daily life of people. So by this way, uh, we were often discussing about what is uh, kawaii, what is the Japanese-ness, what is the uh, uh, selling part of the Japanese culture, contemporary culture. All these things are uh, coming to me. And uh, <coughs> and as uh, Meza san said, I was a member of this advisory committee of the Ministry of Economics uh, for Cool Japan. Actually, myself, I don't like the, the term Cool Japan but it's so common now, so I have to use this. But anyway, <laughs> be because Cool Britannia was used in 1997 by British, right? And then uh, soon after, the Koreans started to use Cool Korea. And now, you know, 2013 or 14, uh, we started to say Cool Japan. It's too late to say. <laughs> we should uh, invent some other word, actually. <laughs> But anyway, so so in that uh, committee, uh, quite many people were members, and they always nominate what is cool from Japanese society and culture now. And of course, there are so many things, you know, cuisine, food, uh, fashion, architecture, art, craft. 
and then they can make a list. But it's not eno enough, or maybe it's not uh, possible to list all the things. We have to see something behind it. And I thought uh, it's kind of a, a aesthetics of Japan, which is unique. So you see uh, this uniqueness in the presentation of the food, uh, fashion, or uh, architecture, or whatever. You see something different, something unique. And this is coming from aesthetics of the long history of Japan. And that's what uh, I wanted to argue in the committee. Yeah, let's, here. Yeah, let's discuss it later. Yeah, it's very important. Thank you. So Kodaka-san, uh, please. Um, I think he kindly prepared a um, short presentation deck. So let's go on. OK. <coughs> Hi, I, I am now from Tokyo Tech Mode. And uh, firstly, it's my honor to politely violate the dress code. And <laughs> no rules in fashion and no rules in otaku field. Um, firstly, otaku means the people who are crazy about Japanese content, such as animation, manga, and comics. Um, but what is Tokyo Otaku Mode? Um, Tokyo Otaku Mode is a curator, um, the same as Nanjo-san, uh, focusing on otaku area. And we were born on Facebook. And uh, so I so prepared this deck. Um, in data, we have three products. So we are company. So I, I'm an entrepreneur. In data, we have a uh, three um, products we are operating. The so one is the Facebook page, and the second one is our own website, otakumo.com. And the third one is mobile app. So in terms of Facebook page, um, we are having now over 13 million fans. Um, it's really huge fan base we have. And actually, 99% of this fan base is outside Japan. So non-Japanese people are watching our curation. What, what, you know, what the heck is going on in Tokyo in terms of otaku area? Because you know, Tokyo is a centric, symbolic city in anime and the comics because they were born in this city. So it's like a Paris in fashion industry, or in New York, Milano in fashion industry. And people feel like you know, new arrival from Paris looks like, oh, it's nice. So it's, it's totally same here as well. The new curation, new you know, happenings, new animation, curated by Tokyo Takamon from Tokyo, from Japanese people in their languages, which means English, uh, would be acceptable. So we were born on social media in Facebook page two years ago. It's completely the same timing. Um, it's just after the big earthquake in Northport. Um, it's the end of March 2011. And we just also felt like we have to restore these Japanese people. Hey, guys, we are, we are cool. We are cool. <laughs> we say we are cool, even though it's not cool. But uh, <laughs> it's OK. So we are very confident about this content, and we love it. So what we have to do is just deliver you know, concisely in the languages. That's all we did. Um, this is like um, comps. In terms of number of fans, um, Tokyo Otaku Mode is ranked number five globally in this category. So top four, including like a Facebook, YouTube, Google. So we are next to Google, and we are over Yahoo and Twitter. <laughs> 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 so uh, Tokyo Otaku Mode is only one vertical media. The others are like a platform, like an infrastructure. But Tokyo Otaku Mode is focusing on one thing as vertical media. So people are liking us because they like this category. And we also have a mobile app which has over 3.7 million downloaded, uh, including Android and um, you know, iOS. So we have Facebook page, own website, and a mobile app. And uh, we, what we are doing from now is that e-commerce. So as you saw in the paper of Umezawa-san, um, the, the bottom part was e-commerce platform. So that's what I want to do as well. Just delivering the news does not make money. That's a reality. <laughs> I know the media. Um, 
So what we have to do is make it sustainable, which means you know, monetization. So what I thought is just is that to deliver the real goods, such as figures, you know, art books, smartphone cases, blah, 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 those merchandise selling you know, those contents related to anime content, other content, to the world who are living outside of Japan, who cannot get those contents easily, that they can get it on our e-commerce site. So we just opened a few months ago, um, and uh, the number of subscribers and number of purchasers are rapidly growing because we have a 30 million fans on Facebook page. So what we are doing is just transitioning those fans into our EC platform and converting them to be purchaser of our Utaku goods. So I, I think I'm personally, you know, running this business and uh, we, we feel, you know, what, what would be deemed as cool in terms of merchandise, animation, and comics, and we know it uh, in, as a reality. So uh, let me get back, you know, what we feel outside of Japan and also inside Japan. Thank you. I have one question for you. You are a former investment banker. Right. <laughs> Did you believe that you can make a lot of money out of it? Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> good, good answer. Thank you. So um, let's go to the core of uh, today's session. That is um, what is really cool from outside perspective. And I think you have different lenses and different fields but uh, somehow we want to come to uh, some, some consensus, if we, we could. Maybe it's, it's not possible to come to a consensus. That is fine, too. So who would like to start? Misha, please. Yeah, OK. Um, well, I can only talk about fashion. But um, in the Japanese um, industry right now, there's two different kinds of fashion. There's the high-end fashion. Um, where, for example, Comme des Garçons, Yoji Yamamoto, Tsumori Chisato, Ise Miyake, those are seen still as very, very cool. Uh, why? Because they all together went to Paris in the 80s, started a new revolution. And since then, it's been very difficult for the Japanese to, to follow that. Um, I think everyone thought, oh, we can follow in their footsteps, but they haven't really found a footing yet. Um, I can talk later about why. But also, of course, street style. So there's Harajuku, Shibuya, and now coming up is Akihabara um, style. And that scene is very mysterious and kind of um, costume-like, but also fun. Um, and it's spreading overseas as well. Uh, on the NHK TV show that I host, NHK Kawaii International, it was voted the number one show on NHK International. And it had only been on the air for a year. So it has lots of fans. It's got a Facebook um, fan page now. It's like 300,000 fans who just like to look at what um, the retail, all these stores that sell this kawaii fashion, what are the girls who sell the clothes wearing? Um, they want to know how they do their makeup. They want to know, you know what they have for lunch, all these cute dishes. What does their dessert look like? And those get the most likes. Um, lots of like those eyeball accessories that are really popular right now. Um, at the same time, um, I feel like at the same, it's, it's a little bit arm's length. It's difficult to get a hold of overseas. You've got many small EC sites um, selling all these, you know, little, little goods, but there isn't a really big place to go to that everyone knows about. You can't go to Am Amazon, you know, and get this stuff. Um, also, the K-pop movement has kind of come and appropriated the Harajuku style and made it a little bit cooler, a little bit more understandable for a Western audience. So it's still kind of seen as Harajuku as maybe young kids, like little kid style. Uh, Shibuya is also like, you know, tween style maybe. It's not really seen as something for adults. But those are what's mostly being looked at right now from overseas. One question. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in common between the Japanese um, high fashion you mentioned, like um, Komi Gerson mm -hmm. or Yoji Yamamoto, mm -hmm. and uh, the street fashion, especially the Harajuku excessive style? Yeah. Um, the common thread in them is that they're both extreme. They're on the extreme ends of the scale. You've got avant-gardism on one end, very expensive avant-gardism, and you have very cheap avant-gardism. 
um, both of them are quite crazy. So Japan is still kind of seen as that weird, you know, crazy place. Um, the middle ground doesn't really seem to work very well. And um, maybe the reason for that is, is that the price point isn't right, or maybe that the sizing isn't right, or maybe it's already available overseas. And, um, but the extremity is what Extremity. What's, yeah. Craziness. WTF Japanese. Yeah, <laughs> WTF Japanese. Yeah, there is a site. <laughs> you, you may want to take a look at it. <laughs> exactly. I, I just, uh, it reminds me of something that um, usually Japanese um, products or aesthetics are known for um, elegance and refinement and precision, all these things. But also there is something different from that, that uh, many cultures in Edo period was supported by a uh, merchant and uh, uh, how do you say general public, and these people preferred uh, not the official uh, uh, aesthetics, but also um, um, more kind of playful uh, expression in any uh, art forms. So when I see the fashion in uh, Harajuku and Shibuya and etc. etc. even maybe high fashion, there is some kind of playfulness, and this is very common. I feel because they don't have a how can I say it's not for the policy or philosophy or concept. They just try and they enjoy, and this comes directly to the products, and this makes uh, stimulate the innovation and creativity in the spirit. And this is one of the uh, quite important feature of Japanese uh, contemporary culture, I think. So you're saying much of the Japanese creation are less conceptual? Um, concept doesn't come first. I see. I think maybe it follows the, uh, the trial of uh, playful spirit, mm -hmm. maybe. So it's, um, yeah. it's more intuitive rather than being conceptual. I feel so, particularly for the, um, the fashion in the town. I mean, uh, in Shi Shinjuku, Shibuya, Akihabara type of uh, fashion, it's made by many, uh, I guess, uh, small, uh, how do you say, uh, creators, right? Designers. Very, very one-man teams. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. And that's also uh, very, um, um, how do you say, um, uh, today's style, I think, because you all know that we're talking about 3D printer, and this makes all the people become makers. And uh, I'm not, I just finished my show uh, last week, but it was a theme of uh, the sh show was uh, love. You know, it's about love. And at the end of the uh, exhibit was Hatsune Miku, and Hatsune Miku is a virtual idol on internet. She doesn't exist, but. 280,000 illustrations about her is up on the uh, net site. And one million songs were made uh, by this Vocaloid uh, software and dedicated to Hatsune Miku. So actually, everybody was makers. And they created this uh, uh, idol. And now Sony and Sega uh, bite it. <laughs> they do a concert uh, in the real. And then on the stage, there is a 3D image of Hatsune Miku standing and dancing and singing. 50,000 people comes. Okay, so it's a huge business now. But actually, this girl is, in a sense, uh, created by anonymous, uh, maybe 200,000 people. So this way uh, is quite um, becoming more common in the creation. And this uh, fashion trend and also many other uh, trends of contemporary culture in Japan is linked to this trend, maybe. That is very true, actually. I mean, we, we have had um, people, a profession called um, Karizuma shop staff, who wear very nicely and representing the brand and actually are creating a new trend. But they are not professional. They, they are just hired out of uh, high school and uh, some of them become Charisma, and, and there have been a couple of uh, celebrities um, from starting from there. So it's a new 
era of actually it's a program for professional people you know <laughs> <laughs> you know, one famous composer told me that Hatsune Miku is a big program for us because <laughs> music professionals that have been trained for every every day they uh, train six hours and from six year old to 21 or 22 year old they continue to train and then they don't know if they, they can become a professional musician but now Hatsune Miku is created by ordinary people right and what is the professional can do you know I know I mean, it's, it's happening everywhere, yeah. consumer-generated or user-generated contents, in a way, a new, new way of uh, collective wisdom. Yeah, it, it's, it's totally trend in otaku field as well. Um, Hatsune Miku, um, do you know Hatsune Miku? Who, who knows? Oh, quite a lot of people. Um, so Hatsune Miku, uh, as Nanjasen told, told um, is a virtual like a idol, um, having like quite a lot of fan base. Um, and Hatsune Miku is, is really good, right? It's because there's no IP problem, basically. I mean, so all the people can change, add the music, let her dance by themselves, if it's not for commercial use. So quite a lot of people loving her and letting her sing a song with their original songs. So all the scenes are created by you know, all the people every minute new creative new creative new creatives. So it's a really UCC, user generated content streaming. And this is, you know, totally the trend on in this social media era. Because all the people have a Facebook page, Twitter, blog. So they have a media to express what they are thinking about by utilizing those, you know, has them equal some other idols virtually. So this is totally yeah, huge streaming line in Otaku field as well. Actually, actually, copyright issue is a very big uh, thing now to, for the culture, right? And uh, I, I think that the cultural innovation should be, I think the, the creator should be rewarded for the, their creation. But also, the cultural assets should be put in a public domain in a, after a certain while and should be uh, used by general uh, public. And the, 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 I couldn't understand why in a museum people cannot take photos of the artworks. So uh, two, three years ago, <laughs> two, three years ago. Well, you I, make it happen then. Yeah, yeah, I made it happen that uh, I invited the Lawrence Lessig, who created the Creative Commons licenses system. And uh, firstly, I, I asked him to give a lecture. Then I convinced the museum people. I mean, inside of my museum. Good job. And then I, I convinced the artist. And then uh, the first show I let people take photos inside of the exhibition was Ai Weiwei, which is <laughs> politically so charged. But you know, everybody uh, wrote a blog and you know, they put the images on the internet. And then uh, I benefited very much. But by this way, I, I think that uh, we should rethink about these copyright issues. Yeah. Well, let's, let's go back to the original question of uh, what is the core of the coolness? And uh, I'm going to ask Kodaka-san about what otaku is. Um, it's a big question. <laughs> but I can say about the cool, um, I can define the coolness can be comprised of two aspects. The one is a visual, key visual, and the another one is a, a story of the artwork. Because um, who knows Dragon Ball or Japanese animation such as Naruto. Um, thank you very much. Sailor Moon. <laughs> Sailor Moon. Sailor Moon. Yeah. yeah. All the animation has two aspects, including you know, visuals such as Sailor Moon, Goku, you know, Naruto, and also story. So this combo of visual and also story has to be the perfect to be you know, really cool ones. So we have to think about each aspect. You know, we cannot think or you know, strategically think about coolness, because it's cool is too broad. So in every minute, we are thinking in, in breaking, the, breaking down into two aspects, um, visual and story. So it had to be you know, perfectly combined in one artwork. So we cannot mix like, you know, story of you know, American style, such as Superman or I don't know, Spider-Man, plus Dragon Ball Creative, it does not work. So it's, it, it, it got to be combo. It, it, and I think it's feel cool for me. 
Actually, it applies to uh, any culture, not only to Japanese. Um, no, a about visual, it can be universal. Because every people likes maybe, I don't know, Goho artwork, um, Toriyama Sensei, um, you know, Goku picture. But some people do not like its story, because story has a cultural background. Mm -hmm. And uh, each, let's say, about you know, Naruto, it's a ninja story. Japanese people can't understand the background perfectly. But maybe, I don't know, non-Japanese people do not understand the truly the background streaming on the you know, creative artworks. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, the key visuals can be universal and it will be popular. But um, the story has to be maybe customized if we go outside of Japan to be cool. Okay, so the story actually needs to be customized depending on the country, depending on the market. Right. You Basically, understand. we have to make it as much as uh, we have to make it simple as much as we can, because Japanese people likes complicated story, such as yeah, too boys like girls, but they do not approach the directly in. Uh, I, I like her, but this kind of yeah, you know. You, you can't you can't tell good good and bad. Right. Good right. man can be bad, and bad man can right. be good. Right, right. Pretty simple story would be um, much easier to understand what the heck is going on in the animation. But Japanese people likes, tend to like complicated stories. Uh, so we have to remake some parts to be simple. But we don't have to change the key visuals so much, but we have to change the story sometimes. So if you make it, it would be really, really cool for the people who live outside of Japan as well. It's my personal opinion. I see. <laughs> Misha, yeah, you you talked about um, you talked about um, what is what is in common between the high fashion and the street fashion, yeah. and uh, you wanted to say something additional about maybe Japanese fashion. Um, well, I guess what I really actually I, I kind of want to get to the third topic, if that's okay, something that Let's go. I've noticed. Um, I say this a lot, actually, when I do the do these talks, and I say that uh, Japan's fashion crime rate is actually low. It depends on what you think is a crime in fashion. But Japan's crime fashion, fashion crime rate is really low. And by that, I mean, how has Akihabara fashion uh, been able to proliferate? How has Harajuku fashion been able to? How has Shibuya Gyaru style been able to become so popular here. And that's because of the Japanese um, inherent culture. Whereas you can dress up like Lolita, like Gothic, in a costume and walk down the street and strangers aren't gonna harass you. It's kind of, you know, you don't bother people. You don't stare at people. You don't walk up to them and start harassing them about what, what they're wearing. And that's why for so long this Harajuku style, kawaii fashion, and now Akihabara style has been able to thrive. Now if you do that overseas, which I've done before, you get you get taxi drivers rolling down their window yelling at you out of the, you know, what party you go into, you know, what costume party, oh, Halloween's not till October, baby. <laughs> you know, Cleopatra, back from the dead, you know, and, and it's just, it's kind of shocking, you know, and it's very difficult to go out and, and to wear that. Um, overseas, and so if Japan, you know, they they do like Japan Expo, and all of these um, brands are trying to take Japanese Harajuku, like Sonomama, just like that, overseas, and it it doesn't quite translate as well. Um, it becomes a zoo, rather, you know, people going in to watch it and to look at it, but not really being able to to you know, put that into their own lives. You can't expect people to dress like that and walk, you know, down the streets of Paris. It's very dangerous, maybe, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I've had people come up to me in Paris and touch me and, you know, grab what I'm wearing and, you know, ask me strange questions. And, like and what? I, I kind of get scared. Well, they'll, like, take my hat off, you know, and if I'm wearing, like, those, what is it, the Mickey Mouse ears that are really popular right now, and they'll, like, try to grab it, and it's like, don't touch me, you know? You can't do that. And you kind of forget that um, the culture is different. And so it's very difficult to just take it overseas. You know, 
um, the the anarchy kawaii girls that are very acid acid colors and the kari pami pami girls or the gyaru type which become, is a very sexy look um, it doesn't always translate 100% overseas so I feel like localization is key and kind of really knowing um, how lifestyle is outside of Japan versus inside Japan. So a lot of times I see these expos and, and fashion brands go overseas um, events and they're not really localized. So you've got a lot of the Japanese team going and just bringing it over there and then wondering why the n it becomes a niche rather than more of a mass phenomenon. So that's something that really sh needs to be um, taken more into consideration when fashion tries to go overseas, especially what is popular right now is the street fashion. And you're helping uh, some of the brands? I would like to, well, I've actually, I've had lunch with the Cool Japan people before and I say this and I'm like, oh really? As if they didn't know, <laughs> it's like, come on. You know, so um, I noticed that there really aren't a whole lot of foreigners um, on these teams that go overseas. And so it's like, it just kind of becomes a core Japanese team and not really understanding what's going on outside of Japan or how the psyche is different or how the cultures are different. You have to help us. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, how to make the business more su successful in overseas markets. Um, maybe Kodaka-san, um, I think you have a challenge at hand and uh, you have strategy. Um. Yeah, um, about the barriers, right? Um, so we are, you know, trying to make to build the e-commerce platform, delivering OTAC content officially. So we are in talks with all rights holders, such as Shueisha, Shogakukan, Katokawa, blah blah blah, those people who has the original rights of animation and the manga and the comics, and they let them the makers, such as Bandai, um, make figures. Um, toys, soft toys, um, tissues, tote bags, and so on. So the barriers is actually IP. So we have to make it clear every single product. But this is really time consuming. That's the reality. Uh, let's say, in case of animation A, the, 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 the head of all the license lives in Tokyo. But they licensed out each country, such as US, for company B, you know, in South, you know, um, America, like Company B, and in Europe and Asia, and each country has you know, sub license, and each country sub sub license to the maker to make the soft toys in U.S., in South America, in Europe, blah blah blah. blah. So if we want to make some products to be sellable globally, it's almost impossible. We have to talk to all the the, the top of licenses who live in Tokyo and talk to the US licensee, licen licensee and also sub licensor. Talk to sub licensee, uh, sub licensor. <laughs> it's so complicated. So, so we, you know, our concept is that to um, protect those IP holders as well, officially selling those, you know, official content products to the world. So we are in talks with all the related parties. But it's like over a thousand companies, a thousand individuals, including, you know, mangaka, you know, the artist, um, him or herself. So it's a reality. So we have to make it simple in terms of IP um, and want to make it, you know, global platform for those people. So please help us from the government. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, what do you think about um, the notion of a creative commons, as Nanjo san described? Yes, actually, um, Joey Ito-san, uh, who was the director of Creative Commons, is advising us as advisor of Tokyo Tech Mode as well. Um, so it's okay if we do it for non-commercial purpose. Um, so we just display this creative is used for this purpose or something. But if we try to make it, you know, monetization, selling those products, we have to clear all the content. So Creative Commons did not you know, solve all the problems right. existing in the reality. Yeah, but if uh, you expand that uh, concept even further, um, maybe distributing um, much content for free mm -hmm. could create a boom for a broader 
ecosystem. Right. And um, that's a part of actually the strategy of uh, the fund I described um, is uh, looking at. Mm. How to do it is a challenge, but. Right. But I think we can learn from YouTube, actually. Um, you know, now YouTube, we all the, from the start, all the contents uploaded on YouTube was illegal. But now, IP holders started to upload their original official contents on YouTube, right? The reason why is that because YouTube pays royalties based on the number of page views, the number of, you know, um, yeah, page views. So which means they manage all the related rights, you know, problems uh, among those quite a complicated rights holders. And they apply officially and uh, they deleted you know, uh, uh, illegal ones and they just uh, left them, um, you know, prey uh, official contents only. And then they make money by advertisement. Because if the, you see the YouTube, you see the ads, right? right? Like a five seconds ads. So YouTube make money and then pay the royalty to the, all the related rights holders. So that's one way we would like to make it on our EC platform. Please come to the contents from all the you know, IP holders and we sell it and we share the, the realities. That's good, that's good. I have a question for Nancho-san. Uh, do you have any thought on uh, how to better combine uh, art and other, other businesses? Mm, art, art is it's complicated. <laughs> uh, you know that in the last 15 years, Chinese art market was booming and so much money was invested on it. And it is sometimes people think that it's easy to control, but sometimes it's not easy. I mean, Japanese art market never so strong, never been so strong. But uh, because Maybe of abenomics, uh, yeah, yeah because of abenomics and also Olympic Games, the Chinese people started to invest Japanese market of art. Good, that's good. Welcome. Okay. Well, uh, what I thought is that uh, to to promote cool Japan, I thought three things. You know, two are in inside of Japan. One is to make a cool Japan museum. <laughs> it's very simple because I'm from museum. I'm thinking about the Kulu Japan Museum. So that museum shows a lot of interesting cultures, of contemporary culture of Japan. Uh, fashion, uh, of, of course, manga, animation, uh, maybe design, product design, etc., etc. And then maybe uh, it's kind of a department like this. It should be a huge museum. And then the content should be changed every six months by the professional people. So it is like a magazine. You you know, it's always changing and telling the most up to date uh, situation of the each genre. And uh, there, there maybe uh, inbound tourists can come and have a look. What's Japanese? And also, uh, Tokyo doesn't have so many spots for visitors. So this will become one of the a uh, very important spot to to come, must to come. Let's go to um, Minister Asosan. Yes, I want to, to, to make I an to, yes, a really I want to do it because I'm so sure that this museum can attract so many people. That's and then, an interesting idea. Yeah. It sounds cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd go see it. I'm for it. <laughs> Good, done. <laughs> so maybe I should mo make a movement, right? And then another thing is that is like this, you know, we should create a more uh, hub of networks of people. Although we can use the internet, still we should meet. So uh, constantly we should have the conference and, you know, um, we should get more uh, research companies, think tanks, and, you know, to make a hub of uh, network and information in Tokyo. And uh, for that, I, I started uh, one conference this autumn because of the 10th anniversary of Moriato Museum. Uh, I proposed this to Mori Corporation. And we're working together in uh, uh, Ropong Hills. Uh, the, the conference is called the Innovative City Forum. So we're working with the uh, World Economic Forum and MIT Media Lab and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the agenda is three, there are three. One is a future city, how we can create a new city, the infrastructure and the image and you know all the technology can support 
uh, this new new city. So it's uh, about innovation as well. And then also creative industry, creative economy. So these three should meet and get uh, discuss and and create a new vision of the human life. That is my idea. So we'll do it in October 16 to 18. So this is the second thing you know we should do inside of Japan. The third thing is to export infrastructure to particularly to Asian countries, which means museum. Um, Japan had built more than 500 museums already in the last 20 years. So we can consult how to make building hardwares, a lighting system and audio system and air conditioning, etc., etc. And then we should educate people for art administration. And by this way, we can create a lot of museums outside. Then we can send contents of Japan very easily because they know Japan, they know the system, similar system. So we can propose many exhibitions and uh, um, uh, ideas. And we can, by this way, we're not just trying to export Japanese culture, but I think this is a way to, 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 to develop both sides, prosper, to go to the prosperity of the culture. And by this way, we should mutually benefit. Uh, this is to help uh, new infrastructure, in particular in Asia. That's what I think. Great ideas, thank you very much. We'd like to go to the floor to give us some um, new thought or questions. Anybody? Please, Mizuno-san. Thank you very much for interesting discussion. Um, it has been pointed out a couple of times by panelists that the, uh, you know, the Japanese fashion is Either it's a high end or like a street end. It's both quite extreme and the craziness in one thresh, you know, the uh, uh, one commonality. And uh, if that's the case, do you think it will always destined to be a niche product, or is there any way to turn that the uh, craziness, extremeness, uh, into the um, the mainstream product? Yeah. Um Gosh, it's been like 30 years now, right? Since the Japanese designers, you know, went on the scene and it's still, that image has not gone away. Vogue America um, um, editor-in-chief Anna Wintour came to Tokyo um, in 2011 after the earthquake and she still, her idea of Japanese fashion was Conde Garçon and Issey Miyake. Um, it hadn't changed. So um, she was introduced to some new designers and, you know, it, I don't know if she had much of an opinion on it. There are some, there's a new brand called Sakai that is quite popular in Paris right now. But how to make that more, less of an extreme and more of an easy way to get it into um, lifestyles overseas? I feel like there should be more collaboration with, with people outside of Japan rather than always having it on Japanese people in those overseas countries. Um, it again, like I said, it kind of becomes a zoo. Like someone looking at it and enjoying and, and seeing it looks really interesting, but how do I wear that? Um, it's the opposite as Japanese people see Parisian fashion and think, oh, I can't wear that, that's too extreme for me. Um, so I think there's problems on both sides. It's kind of like language barrier, barrier almost in fashion. Um, another thing that's very difficult for for Japanese brands to get into overseas markets is that Japanese people are very tiny. Um, they're very tiny, and even I can't I can't fit into some of these clothes that they that they make. Um, it's too much investment, too much money to make sizes. Um, if you want to be successful in Japan and working with Japanese manufacturers, you have to make very tiny sizes. But if you want to be popular overseas and get a market overseas, you need to make bigger sizes. That means more patterning. That means. Um, uh, paying for patterners uh, to make different sizes. And it's a very real problem um, based in reality, need to have bigger sizes. So these brands that do go overseas um, don't really sell well in Japan. They sell better outside of Japan. So then you have this, you, you tend to see overseas when they have these Japan brand like expos and, and um, exhibitions are brands that people I've never heard of. 
it's because the brand is focused on the overseas market and not within Japan. So the stuff that's popular in Japan, can that go overseas? They need a lot of investment. They need help. Uh, um, maybe yeah. we can say that um, those distinctive brands mm -hmm. have our are really extreme, but mm -hmm. at the same time, uh, ordinary people wear uh, less provocative mm -hmm. attire. And in will Japan. that would that be popular overseas? No. Um, uh, maybe the export and import taxes would be quite high, um, and the only thing that I can say is the Japanese uh, quality is very high. Yeah. And so you have a lot of designers working underneath as like the assistant designer, you know, in Japan, a lot of Chanel uses a lot of Japanese textiles. Um, and so that's still, that's very big. And, but there still is a lot of barriers involved in getting that fashion overseas so that people can buy it in the stores even. Yeah. Thank you. Ishigo-san, please. Um, I have uh, two questions for Kudaka-san. Um, I love the concept of uh, anime globalization, but I know, you know, so the IP issue is so complicated. And, uh, you know, so let's say, you know, so the, you know, in order to your company to be a really, really successful company, what a strategy you to take in terms of some focus? You know, let's say, you know, so just to focus on a big hit content or, you know, middle size or small, which doesn't care IP things, what kind of strategy you you, you to take, you think? Okay, um, we are EC platformer, so we are not creators, actually. So we do not create any new Naruto, any new Dragon Ball. So what we would like to do is just to let them, those top, top creators join this platform. So our strategy is, first one is a just expanding number of people okay. we are having such as 30 million fans, or on our platform, we have already over 1 million registered people having emails. So we can send one over 1 million people living outside of Japan with emails directly contacting to those people. So our strategy is just expanding the people we have as platformer to let them join this um, you know, e-commerce solution site. That's one. OK, the second question. Um, is uh, if you know some you know something could be triggered you know for your growth, which is you know so the it it's as long as it is it is technically possible, mm -hmm. is it some equipment or ap application or distribution system could be a uh, uh, the trigger for your growth? Um, yeah, I think the shortest cut is a crowdfunding, um, such as Kickstarter or in Japan I think Campfire or other ones. So, you know, we can fund, we can get like $1 million. Hey guys, who would like to join this new animation on our platform? So, so we have uh, quite a lot of people. Now, if we start like in you know, crowdfunding, and let's say we can talk to the rights holders, hey guys, I will collect like $1 million for this new anime. So let me sell the products globally. So you can give us, you know, the wholesale license to me exclusively. So that's another one I'm thinking. It's confidential. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like, just kidding. Okay. Not anymore. <laughs> <Uchiyama -san, please. laughs> uh, thank you for the discussion. I myself are involved in the digital content provider uh, distribution industry, including otaku and fashion contents. And I found that um, uh, the otaku content didn't wasn't successful uh, four, four or five years ago. And I found that, uh, I'm sorry uh, if you are, if you are uncomfortable, but there is a kind of sort of a prejudice uh, against the uh, otaku contents in Japan uh, because uh, it's a extreme content. So, uh, but uh, in terms of cool Japan, uh, there must be a certain, certain amount of Japanese support uh, to Rebrand, uh, rebrand the Japanese content in the global. So, how would you, how do you think that the solution to uh, get a support, the major support from Japanese people? Good question. Any thought? Cash. <laughs> 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 it's being addressed. <laughs> um, 
uh, for me, um, you know, the right path um, to go to the IP holders is what I want um, continuously. So we are in talks with those, you know, Japanese publishers such as Shueisha Shogakkan and so on, but um, we do not have all the access to all the CEO of those people. So if they endorse us to go to the places and, hey guys, why don't you join this platform? It would be really nice for me. Um, yeah, so it, it's a social proof uh, invested by Japanese government is what I want. Maybe Nanjo san, uh, I think you've tried something along the line. I mean, embracing the Japanese um, extremity uh, and to, to raise the profile of it, like the, the exhibition you had with Aida san yes, or, yes, or featuring mm. Mitko Hatsune. Actually, museum is such a platform. If you show something in a museum, it's almost like endorsing it as a, as an important culture, you know. But uh, of course, because of it, sometimes museums are criticized. But I think uh, in case of um, your uh, otaku culture, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I also feel that there is some kind of prejudice in Japan, and that's why. Prime Minister Aso proposed the museum of uh, idea of museum of uh, manga and animation. Many people were against it. Um, there must be some more careful way to to make it in the right um, track. Yeah, I don't know how to say it, but um, culture is always the matter of psychology. So you have to manipulate this. Uh. Misha, you, you told us that um, this country is more receptive to mm. those uh, kind of extreme mm -hmm. cultural content compared mm -hmm. with many other countries, mm -hmm. including the United States. I think it's just that no one wants to complain about it. Um, on my blog, the, the articles that get the most access and the most talked about are the ones where I'm criticizing Japanese culture. Um, the trends that I don't like. Um, one that I recently talked about is this one called Busu Kawaii, which means ugly cute. I read it. And everyone was, what is that? You know, and I, I don't like the way that they do the makeup. I don't like how they look sick when you know the makeup is done. And and um, it's a very popular you know trend. And it uh, comes down to the point where if you're not criticizing, so people just don't talk about it. You know, and so the fact that I'm even saying my opinion. Um, it gets me criticism as well, but I feel like a lot of these extreme things that are continuing to thrive is because no one's going to say anything about it, in the one thing. Um, and it gets these very, like, you know, small group of very core fans, and that is seen as a huge business. Is it really a huge business? I don't know. But because of how core and hardcore it is, it's considered, you know, super, super popular. I think otaku kind of grew from that, the gyaru. The gyaru is now mainstream. I mean, when it first started, it was very, very niche, very fringe. Um, and now the Tokyo Girls Collection, which is a huge um, day-long uh, fashion festival. When it started out, I was literally like, ew, I'm not going to touch that. And now it's the de facto defining um, event of what's popular right now. Maybe we can say that uh, in the era of internet and social media, actually the mainstream is uh, losing its market share. Mm -hmm. And uh, lots of uh, things on the long tail mm -hmm. are getting market share. So if uh, we, we can gather all those, we can be sizable. I hope so. I mean, it, it, on, the s on the same idea, the gyaru have disappeared and become mainstream. Like they've become, they've kind of lost their their allure. You know, it's just... It's, um, we talk about gyaru a lot on the NHK TV show. What makes a gyaru now? It's basically just the makeup techniques. Well but they're, they're just. They're, there are five to 10 different kinds of gyaros. Oh, there's many different kinds too. <laughs> but it's very. New creatures. Do you know those <laughs> borderlines? <laughs> And again, I think with overseas, when they look at Japanese fashion, they don't see all these little niches. It's just Japanese fashion. Japan is the one that is obsessed with putting them into 
categories and what is this category and not wanting to touch one category doesn't really want to touch another category and on the NHK TV show we'll have like a Lolita sit next to Gyaru and they kind of look at each other and say this is the first time I've ever been so close to a Lolita <laughs> and she's like this is the first time I've ever been so close Broke to a Gyaru gals. you know and it's like f but for me even looking at it, it's like this is just Japanese street fashion it's not uh, you know so categorized and Japan is the one that is obsessed with categorizing it so I I kind of hope that they kind of get this, like, oh no, I've never, I don't know that, and I don't know this. I get over that, and and then go as a group overseas. So it might uh, be interesting. How are you categorized by by typical <laughs> Japanese people? Um, <laughs> it's kind of funny. People call me Harajuku girl, and now they call me like a mode girl. Mode is high fashion, avant garde. Um, I guess it changes. I don't really have a label for myself, and I know that's very facetious. But <laughs> 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 yeah, it's very interesting. It depends. Yeah, but I don't like those categories either, and, and um, I think it's just street fashion is how I see it, and I think that's how the world sees it as well. Okay. Well, you rejected uh, being called kawaii, <laughs> and you rejected being called otaku too. Yeah, right? I did, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, question. gosh. So, Shibusa-san, please. Thank you. Um, I, I heard some uh, key words during the sessions that it's usually not used to uh, characterize Japanese, like e uh, extreme uh, playfulness. Um, but, um, you know, like when the 2020 Olympics was uh, um, announced, uh, BBC reported saying Japanese don't get excited very much, and everybody's, you know, being, being very, very somber. Um, but, but these key words are very, very important for creativity, obviously, right? Uh, and the reason why that exists is, I think, is because there's no ministry of uh, fashion, ministry of otaku, ministry of arts, right? Um, and so m my question is, for this cool Japan fund, when you got the government involved, how, how do you keep the creativity at the high level that it is right now without you know, sacrificing it? Maybe a question for me. <laughs> well, the short answer is that uh, we're going to have a management team composed of uh, experienced business people and maybe creators uh, from the field, as opposed to uh, having um, um, government officials seconded to, to the fund. And after that, uh, we may need to have a um, panel of um, curators to um, cherry pick what we should be really marketing. Uh, again, from uh, experienced pe people from uh, the private sector as well as probably overseas. In, in terms of localization of contents like uh, manga and anime, uh, are there plans for, in terms of a language barrier, how, how is that being dealt with in, in terms of exporting those contents? Again, sorry. Now, there is another uh, government initiative um, by So Musho, Minister of uh, uh, Communications, and METI, uh, with the fund of about 150 million US dollars uh, for the coming three years. Um, and that fund will help um, content holders to translate their contents into a uh, local language. That's in addition to the fund? In addition to the fund. In front of Uh, sort of question uh, to, well, partly to Nandrasan, uh, partly to Misha. Um, I think a couple of months ago it became possible for people from ASEAN to come to Japan without a visa. And presumably, just having much more free movement of people is very good for getting people to come to your museum, maybe very good for getting people to start working in fashion brands who could then be ambassadors and point out the sort of problems that you mentioned. And I just wondered that while on the one hand you have, you know, the METI industriously beavering away, there must be kind of, uh, some of this must just happen by accident, the export of Japanese culture. So are there any kind of happy accidents that you can point to in your field, things that seem to happen as a result of something else? Um, I do know there's one girl who came from Malaysia to Japan, and she picked up some false eyelashes from Shibuya. And now she w was a blogger, and she started wearing these false eyelashes, taking pictures of herself. She became a very popular blogger. She made the sales of false eyelashes go up like 
400% in Malaysia and importing these Japanese, you know, false eyelashes. And then she started doing more um, gyaru makeup products and gyaru makeup styles. Now she's an ambassador for a gyaru brand here in Japan and she comes here and now she has her own brand and is gonna do a project at Isatan soon. Um, so there's a lot of Asian blogger girls who have, who love the Japanese fashion and they come here and they work here for a little while and then they go back and they become ambassadors for the Japanese uh, fashion styles. Um, and I know that NHK has also got these kawaii leaders from around the world that are interested in Japanese street fashion and they kind of become ambassadors in their local countries. But it wasn't that they made them that way, they were just interested and did it themselves and kind of picked up on them. Honjo san. I, mm, I don't know. Um, of course, uh, there are many factors uh, influencing it, but um, Japanese art market was very uh, low key for a long time. But now uh, yen is down, Olympic Games is coming, and also um, the people can easily come to Japan, and they have more chance to see galleries and museums. I expect uh, the, the market uh, becomes more active. Um, there are there are many um, collectors, investors in Singapore, Hong Kong, Korea, and uh, Taiwan, and some some of them think that that Japanese art is too uh, low priced, so they might go coming into the uh, Japanese market. On the other hand, um, the new rich people emerging emerging in Indonesia and Singapore, et cetera, et cetera. Particularly Indonesia is uh, quite um, booming. And uh, quite many young people become art collector. And uh, now they are looking at Japan as well. That uh, recently I heard that uh, the students for learning Japanese language became three times more than in Indonesia. So there is some kind of small boom of the interest in Japan. Um, by this way, art, I think a new interaction may happen for art. In other field, I, I don't know, but I know that Japan is endless, uh, Japan has endless source of uh, different cultures. Um, for example, fashion is of course the one of the best example, but I have many friends in Singapore. They all come to Japan and they go to Harajuku to find small shops. And if you go to Singapore, all the shops are same, you know, the big plan from Europe. So they are bored by that. And they are now trying to dig, dig uh, a small unknown brand in Japan. And, but this happening in many different fields, like uh, tourism, that if they come to very un unknown small local area in Japan, they can discover something quite interesting. Food, a very authentic ryokan, and also the culture, uh, festival, and food, and etc., etc. So in a sense, if they know more about Japan, there are more things to discover. And that is a very rare country, I believe. And this is endless uh, source of even inspiration for creators as well. I think, um, sorry, if I may make one very small point. Uh, one thing you raised, which I think is valid in fashion and, and valid uh, for Kodaka-san as well, is that, I mean, for, for example, in Brooklyn at the moment, there's this big noise being made about rediscovering kind of artisanal culture and people making lemonade and beer and clothes and growing funny beards. But, um, but I mean, in Japan, you never lost that. You never, you don't have to rediscover it. You had it all the time. And that's really one of Japan's greatest Who strengths. Who is the Japanese hipster? It's always been hipster, right? Is what it is. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And as Nanjo-san pointed out, in the end, um, the food, cuisine, is one of the probably 
strongest uh, appeal point we have. As, as you, all, you all know, Michelin, um, prestigious Michelin, thank you very much, rated Tokyo as the city with the greatest number of three-star restaurants. And number two is not Paris, number two is Kyoto, Osaka, Kobe. So Japan is full of uh, great restaurants with such a great diversity. So uh, it's gonna be another key component of our pursuit. Uh, thank you so much for participating, very actively participating in uh, today's session. Uh, I think we got uh, several key points um, listed by the participants as well as uh, you. The first point was to embrace creativity and innovation, especially on the street, by ordinary people. And two, probably we need to streamline Japanese cumbersome uh, IP system and um, being able to develop um, probably more creative solutions around it. And three, we need to attract um, much more foreign talent um, from overseas. And to do so, um, probably we, we need to have something like uh, what you propose, Nanjo san, that you're gonna have uh, next month um, to host a very prestigious conference uh, to, to discuss uh, innovative ideas uh, for the future of the mankind or something about um, maybe culture that's gonna help. And lastly, also from your idea, let's, let's establish the Kuru Japan Museum. That's a great idea. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.